Well, thanks everybody for coming to the meeting today, uh, tonight, tomorrow afternoon, wherever you might be. Um, I've got a colleague in uh, uh, Melbourne that I'm talking to tomorrow evening, my time, the next day in the morning, his time. Um, so we are UX Research and Strategy. We are, um, this is our monthly meeting. We usually have them in person, but for the last couple of months and for the remainder of the year, we're going to have our meetings virtually to both support our um, worldwide community as well as our local Dallas Fort Worth community as well. So if you're looking about where to find us, we're on these four things plus YouTube. Um, so please reach out and social media us if you have the time. We'd love to have more followers and, and have more interactions with everybody. So we talked a little bit about like where you're from. If you wanna take a minute, if you haven't told us where you're joining us from, please put it in the chat. We love to see where everybody's coming in from, especially now since we're all over the world. And tonight we are here with uh, Amy J. Ross from NASA to talk about spacesuit engineers applying human-centric design. So it's going to be very, very exciting. We've got a few um, announcements before we get to the fun stuff. Um, try to get as fast as we can. Uh, our mission, this is what we're here for. We're here to help teach and explore topics related to user experience, research, and strategy, hence the name. Um, but our goal is to make the topics approachable and actionable. So we want to make sure that you're coming away with some concrete examples of how to implement research and strategy methods in your day-to-day -day life, whether you're a student still or in the workplace or aspire to be in the workplace. Who is involved? We've got three ladies, including myself. We've got Jen Blatt, who is a researcher designer at Fidelity. Um, myself, Lori Whitaker, I work at GitLab. I am a staff researcher same thing for principal, so it's the same thing. Never heard of that word before I got promoted to it. Um, and then we've got Lauren Singer, who is a, uh, I'm gonna get it wrong, Lauren. Uh, she's a design manager, I think, over at Capital One. If I got it wrong, forgive me. Um, so the three of us started this group a little over a year ago because we saw that there was a, a need in the market, especially in Dallas, for information around research and strategy, again, hence the name. Um, and so that's kind of what we're, we're doing here. We also are assisted by two chairs, two volunteer chairs. We've got Vincent, who is our volunteer chair. He is, um, when we have events in person, he handles all of the logistics for that. And he's always looking for people to help. Um, if you're local, please reach out to him. If you're not local and you're still looking to help us with something, feel free to email Vincent and let him know what you are wanting to help us out with and we will see how we can incorporate you. Sonia is our sponsorship chair. We run on sponsors. We are not, um, we, we don't get paid. Uh, we, we are a 501c3 organization here in the States, which means we are a, a, a charity. And so if you're interested in sponsoring us, if your company is, let us know. Sonia is the lady to reach out to. And they are both wonderful, wonderful volunteers that we couldn't do this without them. The next meeting after this one is on July 14th and it is in the details. So this talk given by Adrian Guillory and Ashley Connor from Usability Sciences will be talking about analyzing your data. So you've gone through all the hard work of collecting interviews, pictures, survey responses, what do you do with it? How do you make sense of all of that information that you just got? They're going to actually walk you through how to do it and not be overwhelmed. You don't want to miss it. This will be virtual as well, like I said, all of our meetings are this year. Um, and it's going to start a little bit earlier. I think it's going to start around five, I think. Um, check the Eventbrite for sure. It, it's got it on there. Um, we thought we'd start a little bit earlier for people who um, are in different time zones, uh, different areas of the world. And so we're gonna experiment a little bit with that. We're researchers, we love to iterate. So we're gonna see how that goes. And definitely it starts at five o'clock. 
Adrian is also the founder of Dallas Black UX, which is another wonderful local group that we have partnered with in the past. They have a wonderful meetup coming up in uh, this month, I think on the 10th, and it's a UX Careers one-on-one. -on -one. They're also doing their meetup online as well, so you can grab a ticket if you go to that link at the bottom there, and I will put it in the chat here in a second. Um, you can grab, grab your free ticket for that, and uh, they're just a wonderful organization. Adrian's amazing, and so is the rest of her board. They're just, just wonderful. And there's actually another um, black, uh, black UX Austin group that just started a few, like a week ago, she said. So it's just wonderful to see that, and uh, we're always there to help support them. All right, well, without further ado, I will introduce Amy J. Ross. She is from NASA. I got to see her at Canucks in uh, November, October, back when we could travel, <laughs> that time frame. And she was one of the best speakers I got to see in the whole conference. She was just lovely. She knows so much about spacesuits and NASA. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Amy. I'm gonna stop sharing. And that means you can take over. Okay, thank you, Lori. I appreciate the um, introduction and I'm excited to be here with everybody tonight. Um, let me get my presentation shared. And so we're going to do that. That should share. Okay. I don't use Zoom very much. so <laughs> Looking forward to this all week. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Wait a second. I am screen sharing. Now I just have to get my presentation up there. It's right here. It's, it, I, trust me, I have it. <laughs> okay. And then I normally I, Zoom's always, you know, switching between platforms. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, we new teams as well too. Okay, I've got two screens here, so that's why I'm doing weird looking stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can, can you can you see it? <laughs> we did. We did get to see it a minute ago. Okay. Ah, there we go. So we get to I see your presenter view is what we're the seeing. Other, yeah, the opposite screen. All right. Are you seeing the full? Um, We're seeing your side with the notes and the. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll share the other screen, I think. Yeah. Okay. Because I, so I guess I stop share and then I share screen and I share that one. Okay. Yeah, that should do it. Okay. <laughs> Yes, perfect. Okay. <laughs> you can work at NASA without being an expert on computers. <laughs> Let me just tell you that right now. <laughs> okay. So as we do this, um, I do want to say, please ask me questions. Um, I will try to, I can talk about spacesuits all day because I do every day. <laughs> and so um, I will stop and ask if there are questions, if um, you don't feel like you're getting a chance to get in a breath edgewise. Okay. So do feel free to stop and ask me questions as we go, because I, I, I'm, I'm glad we're doing this this way and not just recording it or something because um, I'm so much better when I have people listening to me and I can interact with them. <laughs> I like that better. Um, I've got a lot of teachers in my background, so. And again, and Lori was a teacher. Annie Bella. Um, so just a little bit of my background and I'll talk some more about this too in the presentation. Um, I am an engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer from Purdue University. Um, Annie, I have a new foster dog and she keeps barking at him because he's barking and so that's not helping. Okay, so I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, so I've, I've been learning about what user um, experience and research means as I've been participating in some of these um, groups. And come to find out, I think we really do a lot of the similar stuff from, I think, just a different perspective, um, which is really interesting to see, you know, people apply the same principles um, to similar problems just from a, a different um, kind of path. And so I think you'll see that as we go. Um, just a second, I'm gonna scream. <laughs> Annie, Annie, come here. Okay, I'm gonna grab my dog. And um, so, 
so back to the sorry <laughs> the dogs back to my background so you know there's a lot of different things that a mechanical engineer does um and and being a spacesuit engineer isn't one of the things you normally think of right off the top of your head and so why i like this job and why i think it is also a good place to to intersect with user research um is that we are a human-centered design uh, there is nothing that we need to do more than make sure our human is happy and can do their job and stays alive um, so because we are focused on the user feedback in that process i, I think that does bring us together quite well okay um let's see I'm trying to see what's going to make my slide go. Oh, there we go. Okay. If you're not very familiar with spacesuits, um, which a lot of people aren't as intimately familiar with spacesuits as I am, um, it, it tends to look like a, a garment, a costume. In fact, we call ourselves a pressure garment, which is not inaccurate, um, but it's more pressure than it is garment. Um, and so let me explain that. Um, Spacesuit, like I just said, is not just spiffy clothes. Okay, we are we are putting people into environments that are not friendly to people. Um, we are bottom dwellers, <laughs> and that sounds terrible. Um, but like catfish, we live at the bottom of an ocean of air. Okay, and so we we are we're accustomed to that. We're comfortable doing that. We we need that in a lot of ways. Um, if you put your finger and your thumb together like this, that's about a square inch of area, and you have 15 pounds of pressure pushing on you all the time. That's just air, air pressure, atmospheric pressure. It's almost 15, 14.7 pounds of air pushing on you all the time. Well, when you go up to, say, the International Space Station, that is 250 miles up, which is, you know, a little more than the distance from Houston down to Dallas, or if you go to the moon, which is 238,900 miles up, or if you're gonna go to Mars, which I also think about, then that's 122, 123 round um, million miles away. And these are not, they're far away, <laughs> but they're also not friendly to humans, right? All that nice air that we like to send under, that's gone. And when that air is gone, that pressure is gone. And when there's air gone, there's also not stuff like oxygen that we kind of like as well. And so we'll talk more about the what living in these environments is, is like and how it's hard to keep people alive there. And that's my job. Okay. And, and because I do think first and foremost about keeping people alive, <laughs> in addition to letting them do their work. Um, it, it's a human-centric design inside and out, upside and down, no way you can look at it without making it a human-centric design. Okay, now here's my caveat. <laughs> I am an engineer, <laughs> so I'm not a life scientist, I'm not a physiologist, I'm not a user experience researcher, I'm not a medical doctor, and I'm not an ergonomicist. Um, each of these groups is going to have a different viewpoint on this, and believe me, I deal with it daily. <laughs> so we, you know, I have to get everybody on the same ish page to go forward. Um, but I am coming at it from this engineering viewpoint, and uh, most of what I know about human centric design is not from my ergonomic background, <laughs> but from my um, learning on the job background. Okay. Any questions at this point? I think there were a couple in the chat. Um, somebody had a question about the docking of SpaceX. The docking on Sunday, they heard an exchange about some not quite close zippers on one of the suits, and they were yes. wondering what you had to say about that. Yeah, so um, that's not my um, my work, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference, um, but the people who do interact with SpaceX on their spacesuit are in my group. Um, so there's, there's a branch, and in that branch, one of the groups is the crew survival um, and, and suit and equipment branch uh, group, and they talk to SpaceX. And one of the difficulties they've had during the entire development of that spacesuit, SpaceX suit is the zipper that they use. Um, I was taught <laughs> zippers are bad <laughs> when designing spacesuits. Uh, and in general, for my kinds of spacesuits, which are extravehicular activity or spacewalking spacesuits, Zippers are bad. 
Um, for crew survival suit, zippers aren't as bad, um, and I can, I'll can i tell you why here in a minute. Um, but if you're gonna use a zipper, you gotta do it right. And uh, I think SpaceX is still um, experiencing some of the challenges of zipper use in spacesuit design. Uh, wow. I don't think it's a major problem. They're gonna be checking it out and addressing it before the crews come down in the suits. Um, but yeah, that's gonna, it's um, not a surprise on the first flight of that hardware. Um, okay. Now, zippers are bad because in general, when you, you use a zipper, right, you've got these interlocking components that um, you use that now become part of the structure. And anybody who's ever depended on a zipper <laughs> and then it <laughs> broke when you counted on it most, <laughs> you know <laughs> that sometimes they fail, right? And also, you know, you're trying to hold pressure in. And so you're, you're eventually inflating the suit and then the, that puts the zipper under a lot of strain. And so it's only even more likely to come apart if you don't do it right. So you have to use the right zipper. You have to manage those loads when you pressurize the suit right so the zipper stays together. And um, it makes it a little tricky when you use a zipper. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And we just had a, a follow-up comment. Velcro? <laughs> <laughs> we use Velcro. <laughs> we use okay. not Velcro. <laughs> Velcro does do some good work. <laughs> so does <Yeah>. tape. <laughs> oh, good to know. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Duct tape, capped on tape. Yep, there's tape. <laughs> Okay, was there another question in the chat? Um, let's see. Uh, are the EVA spacesuits you design the same as body formed spacecrafts? So how do they differ from a flexible spacecraft? Oh, they are body worn spacecraft. <laughs> ah, <laughs> right, that's exactly right. one of the ways that we describe them. <laughs> um, what we say is that the spacesuit does everything a spacecraft does for you. Like the International Space Station, what it does, the suit does. Uh, it provides life support. It provides communication with your partner, the ground. Um, it provides uh, mobility, right? Um, and it it lets you get work done in that environment. So those are all the same kinds of things. And we'll talk, we can go more into that. Um, but that's what we do think of it as. Um, now I work on just one big piece of the space suit. I work on the pressure garment and I'll show you in a minute kind of what that piece is. The other piece is called the portable life support system. And that's the big backpack, the big mm. giant heavy box is how they're a, and we're a friendly rival with them. <laughs> Especially now that we're talking about mass reduction, like a big time. Yeah. Um, so they build the big box that has the batteries and the radio and the fans and the pumps and the valves and you know all that good mechanical engineering stuff in there. Yeah, um, and that's why there's people that work on that stuff and then there's people that do my weird stuff. Speaking of your, your specialty, um, what's the maximum pressure that the suit can bear? Yeah, so we designed to um, about 10.6 pounds, pounds per square inch pressure. Um, so not quite atmospheric pressure in our suit. We don't normally operate at that, but the suit is designed to take that load if we do have to go to that pressure for various emergency reasons. In general, you wanna operate the suit at a lower pressure, as low as you can get pressure, just to make it more flexible for the crew members, especially in the gloves. The gloves is the, the hardest part to deal with there. Um, so um, the Apollo suit pressure was 3.7 pounds per square inch of pressure. The current International Space Station suit pressure is 4.3 pounds um, per square inch. And then um, we're looking at having a, a, a multi-pressure suit. And so you may go out the door at say eight pounds per square inch. Um, but then you may reduce the pressure down to five pounds uh, PSI to continue doing your spacewalk, um, just to be able to get out the door quicker and still maintain your risks lower. And this is a question for me. Um, with the difference in pressure, is that similar to like the 787 Dreamliner having a difference in the pressure and having a, a, a lesser impact on the human body? Is that why you do different pressures or is there right. a um, So if you're in Denver right now, um, you're a mile high, right? And because you're at that higher altitude, you're at a reduced pressure um, and the human body can get used to that. Um, people who have lived in Denver and love Denver and spend all their time in Denver don't even notice that they're at you know, 5,000 feet. Um, but <laughs> if you're from Houston, <laughs> you do. <laughs> And if you go up to Kilimanjaro or you go to Mount Everest, 
then you really, really know that you're at a different pressure. Um, and the human body basically needs a certain amount of um, partial pressure of oxygen into the lungs, okay? And so if you get to a high enough altitude, the, there's a low enough partial pressure of oxygen in the, the air that you have to supplement it, okay? So when you fly over like 12,000 feet, 15,000 feet, you are required to have supplemental oxygen because otherwise your brain doesn't work the way it should, okay? Because it needs that oxygen to do its job. Um, and so that, that continues to be true as you go up and up, right? Until you get to a point where there's no oxygen, which is space. And so um, you just have to keep managing the, the happy zone about where a person's pressure and partial pressure of oxygen is that keeps them alive and from getting things like the bins, um, decompression sickness, uh, in those altered environments. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's kind of what I, th I thought, but the, yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah, so, um, you know, it, yes, if you fly on an aircraft and you're exposed to that reduced oxygen level and the reduced pressure for a long period of time, you kind of, it's part of what jet lag makes jet lag so bad, right? You just feel a little groggy, you don't feel real sharp, you feel fuzzy until you can get some of that oxygen back into your system. Um, so if you pressurize the cabin more, put more oxygen into the, the atmosphere, then you feel less of that when you land. Yeah, I know I've been on the Dreamliner once and it was a dramatic difference of how yeah. I felt when I got off that eight hour flight than a regular one, so I can imagine. Unfortunately, as I get older, I feel it more and more when I go on an airplane. Me too, <laughs> me too. Me too. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I've got plenty of questions, so let me know if you want me to continue with them or if you want to go forward. Okay, um, let me see. Um, so we'll, we'll cover some of this stuff. So let me get through a couple slides here yeah. and that might answer some of them and then um, we'll, we'll get back to questions. Okay, so I talked about spacesuits and, and some of what they are and we talked about them being uh, like a spaceship, a person worn spaceship. And so th those functions kind of come down to these three things, right? You're protecting that astronaut from the environmental hazards where they're trying to do their job and, and those environmental hazards look a lot like there's no pressure, which means there's no nothing to breathe, right? And then one of the other big problems that we have is um, thermal extremes. Uh, when I say thermal extremes, imagine you're on the International Space Station. You're going around the Earth every hour and a half. Did you know that? It only takes an hour and a half for the space station to get around the, the Earth. And so, I mean, you can watch a Disney movie <laughs> and have gone around the earth if you're on the international space station which is like crazy and for half of that time for 45 minutes you are on the sunny side so the the sun is pointing at the earth and you're on the sunny side um and so the temperatures over here on the sunny side 250 degrees fahrenheit um you bake cookies at 350 degrees fahrenheit and i apologize to the folks out there that use the si system <laughs> i was born and bred in the english system so um 250 degrees Fahrenheit, and you know when I, I like I like cookies. <laughs> 350 degrees. Do you want to sit in that oven while you're baking the cookies? You do not. <laughs> that is not comfortable. Nor can you be productive in that kind of environment. I mean, we start to wind down here when it gets to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So um, 40 degrees C, <laughs> and so it, it's not not good. Um, and so we have to keep protecting from that. But then. <laughs> When they're on the shady side, you know, back here where the Earth is sh shading, shadowing them from the sun, it's minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Every 45 minutes, you're swinging from 250 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit, so 500 degree temperature delta every 45 minutes, um, and not not nice temperatures, <laughs> really really nasty temperatures. When I talk at school on this cold side, I say, would you like to go? to Antarctica in the winter in the middle of a blizzard <laughs> and sit outside in your swimsuit? <laughs> and the answer is no. No, you don't. And no, you can't because you will freeze to death like now. And it's worse than that outside of the space station. <laughs> so I have to think about how to protect the humans from that. And so first and foremost, space is our protection. Okay, this is the boring stuff. This is the stuff we don't like our crew members to have to think about, but we spend quite a bit of time making sure that we've done this so they stay alive without having to worry about it. And so um, micrometeoroids and orbital debris 
Um, this picture here is um, not a micrometeoroid. This is much, much bigger than a micrometeoroid. We have light gas guns at the White Sands Test Facility out in New Mexico. And they have, the guns can shoot this particle, which still isn't that big, you know, you've got the scale here, to the energy of a micrometeoroid impact, okay? And so the micrometeoroid is actually more like your ball and your ballpoint pen. But the energy comes from the speed. If anybody remembers their high school physics, because it was in high school physics, kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. So yes, the mass is important in that equation, but the velocity is twice as nice, <laughs> okay? So um, 17,500 miles per hour is how fast the International Space Station travels. So if you're dangling on the outside of the International Space Station, whipping in the breeze, uh, you are traveling and going to impact something standing still at 17,500 miles per hour. Okay, just think about that. So there's lots and lots of energy there. And if and you have to ch you have to protect your crew members from those kinds of things. Um, for real, <laughs> we, we do that. Uh, and it's, it's really freaky because in general, we tend to think armor plating. You know, when I was a, a young engineer saying, and told to go work on the problem of protecting the suit from micrometeoroids and normal debris impacts, I thought, you know, a suit of armor. You know, I want to put steel plating all over the outside of the suit. Um, actually, you can see that this is a steel plate that was impacted, <laughs> and that's a bad plan. Um, the energy just gets transmitted right through this dense material and blows out the material on the other side, which, you know, your soft and fluffy self is on the other side. And so you don't want that coming at you. So something very, very different, which I'll show you in a minute, is what we use to protect us from micrometeoroids and orbital debris. It's actually the, the same concept that they use on the International Space Station as well. We talked about thermal extremes. Um, radiation. In our nice, happy, low Earth orbit environment of the International Space Station, we don't have to worry about radiation much, okay? The only radiation we really kind of do address at that point is ultraviolet radiation. Uh, you know that UV radiation is what is going to get you at the beach if you stay out too long without putting your smear on in the summertime, okay? Because even down here at the bottom of our dense uh, ocean of all this atmospheric gas stuff going on, which tends to scatter a lot of the really bad stuff anyway, and we're inside the Van Allen radiation belt, which spits away the really nasty stuff, then you can still get radiation damage that can cause cancer and bad things happening to you. When you're up above our atmosphere, that stuff is direct, <laughs> okay? And the, the most sensitive organs on your body that um, to radiation are your eyes and your skin, okay? Fortunately, most of your skin is covered up by the spacesuit thing, so that's what's taking it, not you. Um, but your UV radiation still could get to your eyes. And so if you look here, um, I'm not sure. Can you see me point? <laughs> well, if you look at the helmet in the lower um, right-hand corner, you can see that we have a visor there, and it has just a few atoms thick of material. It used to be gold, now it's aluminum. Um, it, it's like two or three atoms thick, so it's really, really not that good of a deal to try to scrape it off and make money. Um, but it, that's what really is what is gonna keep that radiation out of your eyes, as well as serve as your sunglasses. Plus just the, the poly um, carbonate that we use for this, the helmet fabrication, the hem helmet structure itself does also screen out a lot of that UV radiation. Now, when you go outside of the Van Allen radi radiation belt, there's other nasties that'll get you. And honestly, we can't protect you from those. Um, there's things called um, solar particle events and things called galactic cosmic radiation. I think there's a new term, but I've got to get up to speed on the new term for the SPEs. Um, but that's high speed radiation, high energy radiation, and really the only thing you can do there is to make sure your spacesuit isn't made of something that makes um, the secondary radiation for when that thing hits you even worse than the original impact, okay? Uh, so then we play, you know, kind of the space is big and you're little and out there for a short time, and so hopefully it doesn't get you. <laughs> you play the odds. Um, now we do that scientifically and you know with models and things, but you still you're you're playing the odds of some. Uh, but that's why space weather forecasting does get important when you start talking about going uh, and spending time on the lunar surface for you know months or years or going to Mars. Okay, 
Uh, then toxic substances. Um, I don't know if I have a, oh, 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 I get to talk about that here in a minute. Uh, you can get, well, well, dust, it can be toxic, um, but say the ammonia tank on the International Space Station links, uh, that's not nice stuff. And so we've got to make sure our suit um, doesn't, it doesn't destroy the suit as well as there are ways to get that off of the suit so that it doesn't come into the space station and, and you know, cause problems inside the habitat as well. Um, dust, of course, is a problem. Uh, people make a big deal about it, mainly because it's not something we've dealt with a lot um, in space. However, we deal with this all the time on Earth. So don't tell me we can't deal with dust because people go to wars in dusty places. I'm just gonna say they fly helicopters in dusty places. They, you know, drive cars in dusty places. Um, they do all kinds of things in dusty places. And so we can figure out how to work in, on the moon with its dust, just saying. Uh, and then falls, you know, if you fall down on a rock on the moon in your spacesuit, it tends to be a little more traumatic than most falls you have here on Earth. Um, now, I did want to talk about this picture here with the fabric. That is what the spacesuit is made of <laughs> in, a, in some parts. Some parts are a composite, but in, in other parts, that is what stands between you and the vacuum of space. <laughs> um, I've got stories to tell about that, but one of the things you'll notice here is this um, aluminum foil looking stuff. It looks like aluminum foil because it basically is aluminum foil. We call it aluminized mylar. Mylar is a plastic film, and then you just put a, a thin film of um, aluminum on top of that. That is your micrometeoroid protection as well as your thermal extreme protection. So this does our thermal insulation largely and then uh, it also is called a bumper shield effect um, because it's a hyper velocity impact. This is not like a, a bullet hitting something. This is more um, of a, a shock kind of a situation and so when the impactor comes in and hits that outer layer, this white stuff, then that's gonna kind of start the shock wave going. And that shock wave hits each one of those subsequent layers and starts to bounce back and it starts to break up that particle until it's smaller and smaller and slower and slower. So that by the time you get to this, um, this layer here, which I call the liner, um, then like 99.999, at least three nines, maybe not, maybe four of nines, percent probability of non-penetration is achieved, okay? And what you don't want is to get a hole in this layer right here because that's your bladder. That's what holds the gas in the suit. Okay. Okay. Any, that's, that's a lot there. Any questions there about that? Because well, like we one, said, this, yeah, this I've got one. does everything this does. Okay, go ahead. I, I've got one. Um, uh, back when you introduced yourself, you talked about um, learning about human factors, user experience on the job, and they're wanting a example of what you might have learned that deals with that. Okay, well, this is a good story. Um, so early on in my career, I was asked if I could take a glove that had been developed in our advanced suit lab and get it prepared to fly for the shuttle program, and the space station program on the suit. Um, so I'd been working with my mentor. I kind of knew some of the background of this glove. I, I knew the features of the glove. I'd been working with it, testing it. Um, and then I was gonna take it to fly it for the first time. And so, you know, I said, well, it's a customized glove. We, we need to get a crew member assigned that we're gonna work with because we need to get their hand mold so we can build this glove uh, to their size. And everybody went, okay. And then I, then they said, okay, here's your crew member. Um, my, the crew member was Jerry Ross. That's not a coincidence. My dad is a retired astronaut. And so he, and a big high profile EVA astronaut <laughs> on top of it all. <laughs> Uh, he, he, for a while, he held, he held the record. He was the head of the EVA branch in the astronaut office, you know, these kinds of things. And then I was to go make sure he had a glove of our new design for flight. So obviously I was highly motivated on several counts <laughs> to do this well. And um, it was really actually a very great benefit to work with this, um, work on this with my dad because he was so experienced and he could give me a lot of really good and educated feedback in a way that was usable for me as an engineer because he's an engineer as well. And so um, learning to ask the right questions, um, learning to hear the answers in a way that were um, implementable to the design, and then knowing how to, to test that design with the user 
so that you know we could get those feedback and we could confirm that we were getting the design we needed um, was all I think integral to me starting to understand how my job as a spacesuit engineer really does so closely interact with my customer, which are the crew members in the crew office. Does that answer that question for you? <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's great. I was scared. Um, that's how I learned yeah. it. <laughs> that's wonderful. I just love that you got to work with your dad on that. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, I, I've got another one about uh, prioritization of features. So space is unforgiving, and I wanted to ask about how the team works to prioritize features that are critical versus nice to have, and how do those decisions affect the final production? Um, so part of my spiel to management is <laughs> I can design you whatever you want. <laughs> um, you just got to tell me what you care about the most. And so we have a lot of those conversations, honestly. Um, right now, the, we have the landers for the lunar missions on contract. So those folks are coming in and saying, hey, we're concerned about how heavy the EVA system is. And so let's talk about ways to do mass reduction. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about what you're going to pay for that mass reduction with. Right. So um, let me think. I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to think of a good example. Oh, um, you've got $50 and you want to go out to eat. So you can either go to a burger joint and get all kinds of food for everybody and nobody has to worry about what they're ordering and you can pay the bill. Or you can go to a really nice restaurant and decide whether you're going to get a drink for dinner or not have dessert, right? <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, there's, there's, only so much you can fit into a spacesuit, okay? And get a certain level of performance. And so you have to kind of, and, and it's um, malleable. So there's lots of gives and takes in there, lots of knobs to turn. And it just comes down to what do you want? Um, I know what I want. I want, you know, I want, you know, I'm an engineer, so I'll keep making it better until you make me stop. <laughs> and I, you know, I have visions in my head about what my spacesuit should be able to do for people. And so, I want to give the astronaut the best tool possible, um, but the best tool is a very subjective thing. And if you can't get them off the surface of the moon, they'll pretty quickly stop thinking of it as the best tool, even if it has all this mobility in the ankle. <laughs> okay, so you know it. It really comes down to, in our world, a mission success. Okay, and so some of that has to get set above me. I mean, I can tell them what I think they need based on what they're telling me that they're asking me. But then when you have some of these harder conversations about, okay, well, you say your spacesuit's this much heavy, but I really need it to be this much. So what happens there? You know, you can lose some of your factors of safety. You can lose some of your features. You can lose some of your mobility. Uh, it all just depends on, you know, you take more risk on, it all just depends on what you're willing to pay for that, that gain in other requirement area. Gotcha, that makes sense. That's very, a, uh, dirty very similar to our stakeholder conversations that we have too with yeah. building software as well. Yeah. Um, when somebody had a question about, and I don't know if this is applicable to what you're working on or not, um, I know I saw the SpaceX um, capsule looking at look very touch screeny. Um, so their question is for the spacesuits, is our touch screens something that you're having to take into consideration as you design the gloves and other haptic interfaces? Right. Um, so there's there's kind of two parts to that answer that I'm gonna tell you. One is that I'm currently working on a suit that we're designing for the the boots on the moon in 2024 mission, right? And um, honestly we're making some gives and takes decisions about that to meet that schedule. Um, Cause it, it's, I counted in months. <laughs> to me, that mission is months away. Uh, yes, they say 2024, but that means I'm delivering hardware at the beginning of 2023. Um, so if you start counting months, it's not that many months. So that's, that's one way you can think about it. Um, the other way you can think about it. Oh, so sorry, I don't think I finished that. <laughs> so, 
once we do 2024, then there's some functionality you want for more sustaining lunar operations that include a lot more of those kind of information systems. In fact, we have a team called Info, um, and, and that's your heads up displays and your, you know, your interfaces for those displays and um, your navigation systems that go with those displays, that kind of stuff. So that's coming. That's more your Iron Man stuff that's coming. Um, one of my other bases of experience for that is you know, when we were trying to decide what our requirements should be and what kind of functionality you really need and want, we do that through various kinds of tests and some of those are field tests, field analog tests. So we go places that are kind of like the moon or Mars on earth, a lot of times in Arizona, and um, although they're in Hawaii and other nice places, but they send us to Arizona. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I like Arizona. That place is beautiful. So. Um, we would go and test the spacesuits there and, you know, try to have some of these systems involved so we understand what you want to see, how you want to see it, and how you want to interact with it. Um, in general, people want to smack that here, right? You want a little finger patty thing here. That seems beautiful when you're walking around without a spacesuit on. <laughs> if you don't talk to me and realize there's a wrist bearing right here. Okay, right in the middle of your arm. This is not a nice flat space. This is a wrist bearing. It rotates. So this is not the place to put some kind of interaction with. And um, even though our spacesuit is better at this cross hand um, mobility, it's still kind of um, arduous to maintain that attitude to interact with a display. So honestly, we're struggling with what to do and how to do that to have the lowest impact with the suit um, and then also be very usable for the crew member. It's a tough problem. Yeah, that is, that is. And I'm, I'm sure you'll get into this um, further in your talk, but there was a question around interchangeable parts. Do, do the suits have interchangeable parts? And then yeah. do, is there a backup suit for the astronauts? Yeah, so if you look at the suit here in this picture, this is the International Space Station suit. And this suit was designed around the same philosophy as the shuttle as being a modular reusable system, right? Because when you flew the space shuttle, you lost the external tank, but you, you know, you saved the SRBs, the solid rocket boosters, and you refurb them to be used again on the next launch. Okay, and then the shuttle, of course, was reused again. Um, so this is a reusable spacesuit. It is certified for 50 EVAs at the time, at this time, and um, we have basically three sizes of upper torsos. So there's a medium, a large, and an extra large. And, and then we just mix and match. I call it the Garanimal, Garanimals approach. You guys remember Garanimals? <laughs> you mix and match the sizes to make it fit you. So there's um, different size uh, lower arms or elbows. There's different size um, waist, different or different settings of the sizing on the waist. And there's different size of leg soft goods, okay? So, and then of course your gloves come in different sizes. We have about 40 different sizes that we maintain in the inventory. And then there's actually two different sizes of boots, but almost everybody uses the bigger ones. Okay, so that's how we do the modularity of the current suit. And honestly, our lunar suit is going to be of the same mind, um, unless we have to get some of that hardware to save um, some of that disconnect hardware to save the mass, and then we'll just size it for the person, and that's they got to be good with that. <laughs> so we'll see how that works out. But yes, we do. And then also in the portable life support system, there are some components that tend to have what we call limited life, so they wear out quicker than other stuff. Um, so if it's not good for the entire 50 years of service that the suit is certified for, then you call it limited life and you have a way to change it out. It's called an on-orbit replacement unit, or you. Very cool. And I know you'll get to this, um, but they're very, everybody's very ready to hear about um, the testing process, the interviewing process, the discovery process that you go through okay. when you Get yeah, that I feedback think, from this. Yeah, so. I can definitely talk yeah. about that. Um, yeah. And I'll, we'll keep going here. Okay. So um, while I said that space suits are, are human space spaceships, um, really the way the crew, our customers, think about them is they're a tool for getting work done. Okay. So they, they have stuff they want to go out and do. And, and if they have to do it in a space suit, they're going to do it in a space suit. And then they want to be able to do that as um, effectively and efficiently as possible in that spacesuit. Okay, so you can see here's the you know lunar rover with the little guy out there doing a job, and this is the um, gamma ray observatory. And uh, one of the stories here was this was a, a contingency EVA, 
This was designed to be um, EVA'd upon if it needed it. The um, big antenna needed to be swung out to get it ready to, you know, because it was in the shuttle payload bay and then it needed to kind of deploy um, before it was released by the shuttle and it got stuck. And so um, this is my dad. <laughs> he went out and I was watching this from college at the time and I could tell, oh, he's there to send him out the door. And sure enough, he was already in the airlock getting ready to go out the door. <laughs> and so he went out and he unstuck that antenna so it was able to deploy and they could release the gamma ray observatory, you know, a multi-billion dollar instrument here. And then eventually we want to go do this kind of thing. Um, this scares some people. I think it's fun. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the good rocks for geologists are never the ones, you know, at your feet or right in front of your face. They're always, you know, down the, down the ravine or off the side of the cliff or <laughs> that kind of thing. So you want to go and do that sometime. Okay. Now, uh, we've been talking a lot about this already. Spacesuit design or designs are predicated on the use environment, or you can say what where you're going, and the required activities. So what are you doing? So I can customize your spacesuit for your situation if you can answer me these two questions in extreme detail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the more I know about where we're going and the more I know about what we're doing, the better a spacesuit I can give you. For example, I've got some spacesuit shoulders that are really good at hammering this way. I have some space shoulders that are really good at hammering this way, right? And, and so if you know you're only ever hammering this way, I know which shoulder you want, okay? It gets to that level of detail. But if you want to do this and this, there's a different shoulder that kind of does both of, both of them fairly well. <laughs> not, not optimized for the indi either individual one, but still does the job. Okay, and because I am customer focused, because I know that in the end, my success depends on my user acceptance, um, and because my astronauts are hyper type A's, goal oriented, get it done, do or die, damn the torpedoes, make it happen, put me in coach kind of people, then I, I need to make sure that I give them that tool, right? Um, like I said, I, I just told you the story about that and his gamma ray observatory antenna. And then also, here's another good story. Um, the, one of the crew members up on space station right now his name is um, Chris Cassidy. He is a uh, Navy SEAL, and he was one of the two astronauts that was inv involved in the EVA where um, Luca Parmentano, uh, an Italian astronaut, had water coming into his helmet. And because of you know the, the tension, surface tension of the water, and, and Luca has pretty much no hair, um, that water just kind of started coming in at the back of his helmet, and then it stuck to his head, and then because the air was pushing it, it crept and crept and crept and crept and crept until it was coming down over his eyes and then coming down over his nose and then coming down over his mouth. So um, as your EVA, one of the things you don't want to have happen is not being able to see or breathe, <laughs> especially you don't want to drown in your spacesuit. And that's what was kind of moving toward happening with him. Um, and because our crew members are so focused on getting their job done and because they are pretty cool cats in general, um, the conversations initially were, hey, I've got some water in my helmet. Well, you know, a lot of times the straw from the drink bag might dribble a little bit, okay? And we're all like, okay, so, okay, what's the problem here? You know, that's usually not a big deal. Why are you telling me about this? Um, and it took him a while to get worked up enough to kind of say, hey, this is my problem, right? I'm, I'm drowning in my suit. And by then, Chris was having to help him get back to the airlock because he could not see. Okay, and, and so, you know, you know, most of us would have freaked out, um, but these guys are just like trying to get their job done and they hate to stop for any reason. And so it took them a while to really say, I got to go in. And they, they just got him inside and the suit impressed and the airlock repressed and the helmet off kind of in time to <laughs> wipe his face off so that he didn't have real survival problems there. Um, we are designing the suit differently now, <laughs> by the way. Okay. And so, you know, like I said, in general, um, you know, Chris Cassidy and Luca Pomertano and my dad don't think about that the suit needs to keep you alive. Um, to the point that even though we train them to know that their gloves are not hammers, they, and you saw just the fabric that is the glove, they use their gloves as hammers because they are going to get the job done. It. <laughs> So that's what we're talking about here as far as motivated users. 
Um, and like we said, they are focused on what you're doing and they expect me to give them the best tool they possibly, I can possibly give them. Okay, that is my job for them. Okay, so how I'm judged, and, and you know, if you do, do design software, you know this, is um, you know, how, how happy is your consumer using your product? <laughs> Okay, doesn't matter how many fancy features it has, it doesn't matter how many hours you spend or how well notated your code is, it matters <laughs> how well the user can get in there and poke the buttons. And then you gotta deal with users like me who don't like to understand how all that needs to work anyway. So, um, you know, I'm gonna be one of those complainers at you. And, um, you know, some of my crew members like to come in and tell me why they can't do their job in their spacesuit and it's always the spacesuit's fault. <laughs> so, that's important. Now, um, again, the caveat, I'm just an engineer. <laughs> I'm not an astronaut, so I'm, I'm not the end user who has to go do this job uh, out in space in these environments. And I'm also not an ergonomicist, nor do I have a human factors background. Um, so, you know, what's my experience that I used to draw on to do human-centric design? I said I learned this on the job, but I also learned it from being a human. <laughs> um, my big advantage is I may people do. <laughs> so, although I'm not an astronaut, <laughs> I can imagine what it would be like. <laughs> and I can know some of the things I care about when I'm stuck into a shell, like a, um, you know, a, a bean in a can, and I need to go out and get something done. And so uh, there's a lot that really just putting yourself in the user's shoes can do for you. Um, because you know, they're, they're people too. Um, they they want to be comfortable. They want to be efficient. They want to get the job done. They want to you know make people happy. And so they're gonna be happy if you can help them do that as well. Okay, so while, like I said, being an astronaut may not be what you are. It may not, you know, being an astronaut is not your daily experience. You're not a race car driver. You're not a soccer mom. You're not a train station attendant maybe. You're, you're maybe, um, <laughs> you maybe are late doctor, web illiterate, web, web illiterate first time online bank account user, right? Um, or, or you're not a use experimenting with drugs, um, like we heard at the Canucks talk, yeah, the Canucks talk. Um, those may not be part of your daily experience. However, whatever kinds of, uh, you know, jobs your, your career brings you, you still have the bulk of your shared experience of being a human with anybody you're trying to design for. And so, I would, I would dig down to that a lot of the times, because a lot of the times we can overcomplicate these things, but at the base, it's really simple. You're a human trying to get something done. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's a lot of variety in humans, which is why being a space engineer is so interesting and why it's um, also such a challenge. <laughs> but that is a, a huge strength to leverage as well, okay? So there's some specific methods that we use to do that. Uh, and again, these are not <laughs> big corporate secrets <laughs> or um, something you couldn't have written down yourself, but they're still, um, because they are so basic, sometimes it's good to go back to those things. And then there's simply things such as, put yourself in your customer's shoes, okay? Um, and that could be literally or imaginatively, but one of the things I do in my team is I, I make sure, and I might have this on a future slide, but I make sure that if you can, you get into a spacesuit, okay? It is a weird experience, and so it is kind of outside your daily um, existence, but if you can get into that situation, um, drive a minivan, <laughs> you know, do some of these things you may not do every day. If you can get into those situations, then you can, um, or sit by somebody who is, you can get a lot of that um, experience for yourself, okay? And you know, we all know we're human and that's why we send people to these weird places that take uh, all this money and take a lot of time to get them there because um, we think that that story from the human firsthand is so much more important than the pictures from the robot, right? Um, even though we didn't get to go ourselves, that human is more like me than that robot and so them telling me about it is gonna be much more meaningful than the pictures from the robot. Okay, so that's one of the things that we talk about, and I think I go into this more. Um, every person is different. <laughs> the blessing of the curse of human-centered design. <laughs> so uh, some days it feels more curse than blessing, 
but um, it is it is the fun part too of of thinking all the different ways that people can um, work and and think and use. And one of the things that it's fun in my group because we're weird is that we always look at how everybody moves. <laughs> so hey, can you do this? Hey, can you touch your toes? Hey, can you bend this way? Hey, can you reach that? And it's just super interesting to see all the different differences and just my team about how the human body works. I have a guy who can't get his arms up above here. Um, I, I can put my palms flat on the floor. Always have been able to, I always will be able to. Um, I don't think it's really anything special, it's just how I'm built. Um, while some guys can barely reach their knees, right? I mean, it's just the way they're built. And so just seeing that those are realities for people is important to understand. So, you know, stepping into some of those realities of people different from you is um, extremely valuable because uh, you're going to see that come at you through your customers, right? <laughs> um, watch and listen. This is a super important part of just being human, right? Um, we all know that sometimes our friends just need us to listen. Um, and a, a, along with that, one of the reasons I'm actually considered an expert in my field is just because I've watched spacesuits more, move more than just about anybody. I've just spent more time sitting in front of a spacesuit moving and seeing how it does what it does. And, and that just means I've got more of that uh, background in my gut to draw on um, when I'm seeing if something's working or not working or needs to do something different. Um, and then test, test, test. Uh, you can't get away from that. If you're doing something weird, different, new, um, test, test, test is the way to go. Because uh, you just need to keep putting it through its paces, trying to break it. And, and making sure your users are happy with it before you can be sure that it's gonna do the job when you field it, okay? So here's some more of that here. Um, and I did draw on some examples from Canucks too. Uh, there were some really great presentations there. Uh, so the put yourself in your customer's shoes. We talked about this some. Here's me and my customer's shoes, right? This is a, um, this is the waist entry eye suit. Um, I'm on the Vomit Comet. Do you guys know what the Vomit Comet is? It is an aircraft that flies a parabolic flight path like a roller coaster over and over again on the order of 40 to 60 of these things. And as you kind of come up and over, you, you can have a simulated uh, micro-G or moon gravity or Mars gravity experience for eh, 23 to 40 seconds <laughs> before you crash into the ocean if you didn't pull up and do it again. Um, vomit Comet because you go up, you have this fun reduced gravity experience, but then you pull up which you want to do, but when you pull up, <laughs> you get two Gs. Um, and as you do this over and over again, 40 to 60 times in a flight, um, some people tend to upchuck. <laughs> so there you go. In fact, I have guys on my team that just can't fly because they just upchuck. <laughs> they give you meds and everything and they just, they just can't do it. Um, okay, so you know, one thing, here's another way you can think about doing this. You know, you're not getting into a spacesuit, but some guys when they were designing, guys and gals, when they were designing um, an adaptive controller, uh, and I forget which company now, I don't think it matters, but they were trying to make sure it was usable for people with all kinds of physical capabilities or a lack of capability. And so tie one hand behind your back, put glasses on that made your, eye, your um, sight fuzzy or just you know no sight at all. Um, just be able to use like your elbows down. I mean, your elbows up, right? I mean, just just things that you could do to have you experience what it might be like to not have all the capability you're used to having. And, and those were you know things that could just do in their lab and and kind of experience what their their users were experiencing with their old hardware, and then thinking about new ways to be able to to accommodate for that with the new hardware. Okay. Um, also, Eurostar. They were trying to improve their customer experience as well as improve their boarding process. And so they worked on the software side of it for the people buying tickets online and things. But then also they were following the, the ticket takers and the, the platform personnel in, in assisting the customers to getting on the, on the train. And so one of the things they saw was that the, these, these ticket takers were really having a hard time making sure they got the customers to the right car. You know, are you in first class? Are you in second class? Yeah, where are you? Um, and it was, it was slowing down the boarding process. It was making the ticket takers frustrated, the boarding people frustrated. You know, it was, it was a bad experience. And they, they figured out that all they had to do was 
make the tickets different colors. So all the ticket taker had to do was see the color and they could point them straight to the, the right train car, right? Huge for everybody, right? As a customer, I'm happy. I get where I need to go super fast. The, the station attendants are like, woohoo, you go there, you know, easy peasy. And so just a simple um, change like that was able to, um, whoa, oh, I've got some kind of software thing popping up, um, was able to make their whole process better. And that was just from the, the user, user experience teams coming out and shadowing the people doing the job. Okay. Okay, so, and I talked about getting people in my team in suits. In suits. So um, this is one of my suit test engineers or was, he was, he's moved back to Nebraska. <laughs> um, but this is our spacesuit um, called the Mark III. It's a prototype with the actual, the portable life support system here in this um, chamber. So the life support system is actually supplying the gas and the pressurization for the human in the suit here. They're on a treadmill and they are, they are providing metabolic load is what the PLIS team would say. Um, they're providing carbon dioxide and sweat <laughs> and breathing oxygen <laughs> and creating heat. Uh, so all that stuff is going to then be addressed by the PLIS system. Okay, so this is um, Ian McGinnis, and he is in the suit. Okay, and that's his wife behind him, by the way. She's on the PLIS team, <laughs> which is fun sometimes. And then here's uh, Richard Rhodes. He's my hardware design lead, and he is in the Z1 suit. And then here is Lindsay Aitchison, who used to be on my team and is now at NASA headquarters, and she's in the Z2 suit. So, uh, you know, I stand by my word. You stick your people in these suits and make them move around in them and they have a much greater appreciation for what they're trying to achieve and what their subjects and, and users are experiencing when they're trying to use their hardware and what kinds of, you know, questions you might ask and what kinds of feedback you might, might get out of it because you might have had the same problem. Okay. And then um, here's, we, I've talked about the SpaceX suit. This is NASA's uh, version. This is actually an earlier version. Uh, this is the ACES. They now use the Orion Crew Survival Suit called the OX. Um, there's an acronym. Surprise, surprise <laughs> for NASA. But um, our suits are normally, our crew survival suits are normally worn unpressurized. Okay, that's why zippers work at all with these suits. And um, they're all, we almost always make them orange as well. Um, let's think about where this is an Orion capsule mock-up, where these vehicles are going to land. Where are these vehicles going to land? They're going to land in the ocean. If there's a problem, you're going to have to get out of your capsule and into the ocean. What color <laughs> do you want to be if you land in the ocean? Do you want to be wave cap white? Or do you want to be orange, international orange, international search and rescue orange? <laughs> I vote orange, but that's me. Okay, <laughs> sorry. That is one, one problem I have with the current suit that they are using with the SpaceX. Uh, I think it's important to be able to find your crew members if they get lost in the ocean. Yes. Okay, um, <laughs> this is the Apollo suit, okay? Uh, and until recently, we were still putting people in there to test with it, but now we tend to consider it as an asset. And we tend to not want to break it. Um, this is a current spacesuit for the International Space Station. The, and this is a young lady who was responsible for testing at the time when we took this picture. This gentleman is the lead of this team. This is a geologist who's worked with us in this suit out in the field for quite many years. This is my systems engineering and integration lead in our, um, this is a waste entry I suit. This is one of my technicians in the D suit. And this was my deputy at the time, Brian Daniel, in the Russian crew survival suit. Okay. So again, put, put yourself in that position as best you can. And, and the more people on your team that's had, have that um, opportunity, the better off you are. Because then you're all talking in the same language. Okay. Now, we'll talk some about this too. Every person is different, and that's a good thing. Um, until it's the 10th of 10 subjects that comes in and says, I don't like it, when everybody else said they did. <laughs> and then you're not so happy about the differences. But um, for our business, size and shape make a lot of difference. Um, for example, on my body, 
um, there's some critical, and I think the next slide shows this, there's some, there's some critical um, dimensions that we care about in designing the spacesuit. Um, your shoulder mobility is largely predicated on where your acromion is. Your acromion is that little knot on the top of your shoulder where your collarbone meets your you know, shoulder blade here. And then the biacromial distance is a little is the distance between those two knots. Okay. Um, my biacromial distance is in the sixth percentile per the answer database. The answer database is an army database, army navy database, where they measure a whole bunch of people, and so they have all kinds of statistics on these measurements and their, how they're correlated or not, blah blah blah. Um, and you know, percentages percentiles only matter with respect to a database. Okay. So um, I'm sixth percentile here, and what you can't see is I'm nine. Um, 95th, 97th percentile at my hip. Okay, thanks, thanks, Grandma. Um, but I, I, honestly, I don't look that weird. <laughs> Lori saw me, she can say, I don't look like a freak of nature, but on my body, I've got from 6th percentile female to 90, I think 97, 98 percentile hip breadth. Okay. Um, and, and everybody is this wicked mash of all these different. Um, percentiles of dimensions across their body. So I need to make sure, and I do work with a group called the Anthropometrics and Biomechanics Facility, because you know, you know, a lot of times the expert really is worth their money, um, <laughs> to bring in the people that really understand all this um, anthropometry about the human body, and they can help us make sure that when we design a spacesuit, um, the variety of different correlated dimensions will fit in it. <laughs> Um, otherwise, you're um, really getting serious about that test, 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 and you're going to go find people with those varieties of dimensions, and that's going to be a long and arduous and expensive kind of a uh, project. And so uh, we use our models from the, the anthropometric biomechanics facility uh, to help us with that. Now, when we do that, though, we do have to verify that our assumptions about the modeling are correct. Never trust a model. Models are just um, high five approximations, right? And so what we do is we, like we, what we did this time anyway, was we built a 3D print of our upper torso. And then we stuck some people where we understood what dimensions they had on them into the suit and saw if they fit or not and kind of how that correlated to what they would look like um, from the model side in the suit. Um, so we could get some of that direct human feedback about, okay, uh, I'm, I'm squishy here, and so this feels fine, even though it looks like in the model I wouldn't fit because there'd be an interference. Um, but no, that's a rib. You can't squish that. That hurts, right? Um, so you get some of that feedback uh, about how well your, um, your information does correlate to reality. Um, and then mobility is the same thing. Uh, I used to be a gymnast, uh, and I, I was even more flexible than I, I still currently am at the time because you know, I could do the splits and all that good stuff. Um, but there were there were girls out there who could do the middle splits hyperextended without even trying. Um, that is freaky. <laughs> uh, but people are built so that, that that's just the way their body works, right? And so you just need to be aware of the 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 kinds of variations in mobility that you also are trying to accommodate. Because when I put somebody in a suit, basically I, I want them to not have to think about it much, right? I give them a tool, right? And the, the more um, innately usable your tool is, the less mental and physical effort goes into using that tool and the more effort that can go into getting the job done. And you know, what are my people like? They want to get the job done. So I, I try to make that screen between them and getting their job done as low as possible, as, as um, as easy as possible. Okay, so here's some of that information about what these different sizes look like. So these are some of our um, some of our critical dimension kind of things. Um, we care a lot about uh, chest breadth, for example. Chest depth is a good one. Crotch height does matter. Actually, stature doesn't matter a whole lot. That's pretty easy to accommodate for. Up until like the six, seven, six a nine range, then you start to struggle a little bit, um, but it's just more sizing rings. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> I can build a spacesuit for an octopus if you need me to. <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> just you gotta give me the money to do it. That's the that's tricky bit. <laughs> um, so I used to get beat up for not building small suits. I'm like, people, I can build a small suit. You just, I want to build a small suit, right? I'm, I'm five, 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 four, <laughs> five, five on a good day. Um, 
so no problem here, just it, it costs money. And so far, nobody's given me the money. So uh, there you are. And then um, let's see, another good one. Oh, here's your, oh, believe it or not, some of the, sometimes the biceps circumference kind of gets you because we have to build a, a bearing for here. And uh, some of those folks get really um, muscled up before they do an EVA, which is good on one hand, but if they don't fit in the arm bearing anymore, it's not good. Okay, so that gives you an idea of some of the things that we look at. And here's another picture here where we, these are these are people I pulled out of my building, right? Um, this is a an analyst. Uh, this is a deputy branch chief. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think I think that's one of my teammates. Uh, this is one of my technicians. And you can just see that the range of their different sizes, shapes, uh, and some of their critical dimensions here that show, like, here's me, I'm test subject number two, here's my sixth percentile, oh, 95, hey, I'm not as bad as I think, um, 95 hip breadth, so I used to be, <laughs> I used to be worse, um, so that's, that's part of what we look at here, and in fact, one of the interesting things here is, this is the shorter stature person, but they have a longer arm reach than this person, so yeah, you can't make the assumption that the shorter person has less reach, because that doesn't work. And I was talking about that modeling. So here's where we've scanned people. Um, and this isn't these bottom mo body models I was talking about, but still the scans of the people matter. And you can see that's the model of the suit and you can see how they fit in the suit. And then here, here's the fit check of the real person in the 3D. Okay, so you can see it, it kind of matches up fairly well. It gets some feedback. She's pointing out where she's got some contacts up here front where you can kind of see it does show like it interferes in the model. Okay. <clears throat> oh yeah, here's your at home mobility activity. <laughs> uh, toe touch, you know, gather those quarantined with you <laughs> and do your toe touch exercises and see see what they are. It's fun. Um, overhead reach, you know, can you get your can you get your bicep? Oh look at the ex the gym's flexible. Get your um elbows, I'm not your elbows, but your biceps right up against your ears or not. Um, some people just can't. Uh, so understand that and then um, squat without lifting your heels off the ground and see how far you can get without falling over. Um, some people can really, you know, you know, look like they just live in the jungle and, you know, eat worms or uh, other people <laughs> fall over like, like a doodle bug. So, <laughs> you know, bad egg. Uh, so it's, it's fun. You'll entertain yourself. So you will see that everybody has got different mobility capabilities. And uh, you know we we have to pretty much design across that. Although um, don't give me a ballerina and tell me that they need to do ballet on the moon because um, that's going to be a problem. Okay, and then the watch and listen. Uh, this really isn't that hard. Um, so you know listen to your customers, obviously. <laughs> um, and and we do. We've got meetings, regular meetings with them. We include them in our testing, and so uh, we collect that kind of more formally is in the form of surveys and questionnaires um, and ratings. But we also just do that from just chatting and listening to what they have to say about what they do, how they do it, how they liked our hardware or didn't. Um, and so that listening is real important. Um, for one thing, it, it tends to, I've got a limited customer base, right? So for me, it tends to allow them to feel bought in to our process and that they're being heard so that their um, concerns are being addressed. And so they have less concerns about my design and less concerns about my hardware as we go on because they, they feel like that's already been accounted for, which is a beautiful thing. And then, um, you know, experts from related groups, like most of our crew members are not geologists because they're gonna be asked to do geology. So let's go to the people who do geology and find out how that's done and what they think about how the suit lets them do that. Uh, and so we've also gone out and they've done some training for us where we get to go out in the field for a couple of days and do geology with geologists, um, which, which was fun. Um, it was good exercise, by the way, because <laughs> a good rock is never right in front of you. <laughs> so, and you can learn how to recognize when there's a rattlesnake nearby and you can get, you know, stuck by cacti and things like that. But it, it's, it was a good time. Um, tool designers, the people that are going to design these tools that they're going to use to do the geology. Um, that they're also good to have on board so that they understand the, you know, the, the capabilities the suit does and doesn't have, so they don't design tools that um, need to have capabilities they don't have available. Um, and then lunar lander designers, you know, you got to stuff the suit into something. 
make sure these people are thinking about the things you're thinking about too when you want to stuff a suit inside of a lunar lander. Um, you know, how are they going to reach the controls? Uh, how are they going to be restrained in the crash landing? You know, those things like that. And then, of course, those silly doctor types and the actual ergonomicists out there. Um, you got to make sure you understand what their concerns are because, you know, their number one and only priority is to keep the crew member alive and kicking. <laughs> and this whole moving stuff is, you know, kind of a sidebar as far as they're concerned. So you got to make sure they're happy as well because they worry about those things for the crew because the crew doesn't want to have to think about it. Okay. And then um, also my mentor worked on spacesuits for 50 years. Uh, there's no way I'm not going to listen to what he has to say. So I still go to lunch with him um, monthly when we're able to go to lunch. And, you know, we, I bring him questions that we've come up against during the week or month and uh, see what he has to say about it. Because, he, you know, he's probably seen it done it a couple times, <laughs> if, if um, not several more than that. Yeah, this is Joe is my mentor. So this is uh, him out at a field test. <clears throat> This is him in Clear Lake testing a, um, well, this at the time, it was just a flight suit uh, with a, you know, raft for crew survival. And then this is him oh so <laughs> attractively modeling a spacesuit <laughs> in profile. So there's Joe. <laughs> okay, then test, test, test. And that testing should start with you. You should try the thing. Now, you may not be the best test subject because you're in the middle of it, right? You know how it works, the ins and outs, the things you're trying to do and attempted to do and what things mean. Um, but still, <clears throat> you may have thought that's what you were doing, but you may realize that that's not what you did. <laughs> so it's always good to kind of um, proofread your work <laughs> before you share it with others. So that's a good technique. Then um, your team. Same thing, uh, they need to know what they're producing, they need to know how well it works, and they might find some glitches that you didn't expect. Um, if people want to break something on my team, we hand it to Richard Rhodes, and he will find out if it has a flaw. <laughs> and then we go, yay, we run the flaw and we fix it, before we show anybody else and are all embarrassed that we didn't break it before we got to them. Um, related people, I'm talking about those geologists, those tool designers, those lander people, um, bring them in, help them understand what you're doing, help them understand what you're up against. Um, you know, nobody understands what you're doing like you do, but you can help them get closer if you include them in this process. Okay, of course your customer. <laughs> uh, in my case, my literal hardware acceptance is dependent on my customer. Um, I have to put them in the suit and test it and get a specific level of rating out of them um, and and no less than five, usually six or more, uh, before that I can sign off that I verified my requirement is being met. Okay, and it literally depends on, on them. And then um, you need to do this in a variety of mental and physical conditions, right? <clears throat> we all know that if you are driving a car on an open road with no car problems and all the gas you need, this is not a problem, right? This is a very doable task. Um, let's talk about driving uh, into Atlanta, <laughs> 90 miles an hour in traffic, and you're almost out of gas. You know, there's a lot of mental and physical stimuli hitting you at the same time. And uh, driving that car becomes much more challenging all of, all of a sudden. So you don't wanna just operate your system in the most amenable scenarios you also need to check on some of these other cases that make it harder to use and make sure your crew member's still happy about it or your customer. And so um, this, is, this is me putting crew members in spacesuits and getting feedback. So this is uh, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. It is a 6.2 million gallon tank of water. Swimming pool, giant swimming pool, whatever you want to call it. And this is where we simulate microgravity and we had our our astronauts get in our suit weighed out to microgravity so they don't float to the top or sink to the bottom and do their spacewalk stuff that they would do on the space station <coughs> excuse me and and we had them tell us about it did they like it did they not like it what they, what did they like what did, didn't they like um this crew member liked the mobility of the lower torso to get into this foot restraint this crew member didn't like how tight this squeeze was through the airlock hatch. So we are maintaining the mobility here and we are making this whole dimension shorter so that this is an easier 
tasked to do, okay? So we took that and we, we did affect the design. Okay, and here's my geologist in suits or subjects or astronauts who need to do geology, um, all giving me feedback in an analogous view scenario um, and seeing if they like it with geology tools. <laughs> Again, here's some sciencey things. This is a, a science experiment package. Uh, this is an instrument that was designed by some scientists to um, analyze samples quickly to see if they had uh, signs of life in them, okay? Which is pretty cool. <laughs> and then, ah, okay. Let's see how this works. I think, there we go. <clears throat> this is the vomit comet. Ta-da! And that's all the time you get. Down you go. <laughs> okay, and you get them up and you do it again. So that's what a spacesuit looks like moving in one six gravity. That was um, moon gravity. Oh, no, that's Mars gravity. Sorry, that's Mars gravity. <clears throat> Mars gravity is a lot more like one gravity, Earth gravity. Oh, there's me. Okay. Right there. I think the video just was choppy for us, so maybe we'll get a link to, from you later, Amy, and we can okay. share. Okay. Yep. Uh, I'll play this one anyway and see how it goes. Yeah, it looks like maybe it froze. And Zoom's okay. not so so swell about supporting other people's videos. Yeah, <laughs> I did read um, read your thing, but it says yeah. to go tap optimize, and I'm not seeing it right now. So, okay. okay. Um, so the the bottom line to all this discussion is that if you are human, you are equipped to do human centric design. Um, it, don't make it overcomplicated. Don't don't think you can't. Um, you've got the bulk of the tools you need, and then you. What you don't have, you've got friends. <laughs> friends, teammates, um, grandmas, you know, whoever you need to, to pull in to get it done. Uh, you, can, you can grab them and, and go. I, I think I saw a hand raised to be a suit subject, maybe. <laughs> Careful, we're mean. <laughs> and so now I, I think there's more questions. I'm sorry, I rock. That's one of the things I do. My team gets dizzy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> And since I can no, work from home, I can work from my rocking chair. So. Right, exactly. You gotta be comfortable. Right. That's the yeah. first rule of working from home. Um, we've got some questions around um, design, and you touched on this a little bit, designing for women or people of smaller or different stature. Yeah. The, I think, I don't know, time flies, but remember the two lady, lady astronauts, sorry, the two astronauts who were female um, who wanted to go on the spacewalk, but they couldn't because the suits were too big they didn't feel comfortable in them and you spoke a lot about like give me money and i'll make you a space yeah, suit yeah we'll do the thing yeah how, how do you how, how does that kind of i don't know like like how do we balance that and how do we yeah. maybe talk people into giving you the money so these women can go outside on their spacewalk well let me be clear right now i i, I do i have the requirements to build from the first percentile female to the 99th percentile male so right now, in general, what the American space program does is tries to be very inclusive, okay? So if we select you to fly in space, you should be able to have a suit that lets you do a spacewalk, okay? So that, that is our going in situation now. Um, early on in, in the program, um, they, in the shuttle program, they did design. They designed, um, I think there were originally five sizes. There was a extra small, small, large, um, extra large, I think, oh, no, sorry, there's a small, medium, large, and extra large, okay? So we still use the medium, large, and extra large, but we, we don't use the small and extra small anymore, okay? So they were designed, um, but then cost, you know, measures kept people from maintaining that full fleet sizing. With our design, we only have two upper torso sizes. Annie Bill. And um, so with those, Annie, you're okay. With those two sizes, um, we are able to fit that full range of people so far. So that that is a big benefit because 
then we were able to still accommodate everybody without some of the impacts that the five sizes gave. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, we've got a question around how does one become an Amy? How, how do I get this job <laughs> yeah. at NASA? <laughs> how do you get this weird job? <laughs> um, so um, I knew that I when, I, when I was looking at jobs, I thought, you know, working in the space program would be a good one. Um, I had the very great benefit of having both of my parents working in the space program. And so they were able to help me ask them those questions early enough that it really helped me down my path. Um, turns out there's this thing called the Pathways Inter Internship Program. And that's the way to become a civil servant. <laughs> um, and so what that did was that allowed me to get hired as a student, as a civil servant. And then that program lets you move around throughout Johnson Space Center. And you know, depending on where you get hired, different centers, or you can change centers, but usually you pick a center. Um, and I wanted to work on human space flight. So um, I, I worked in the crew office for a while. I worked at White Sands and Blue Sands Up. I, um, what else do I do? Oh, I worked in flight operations. I trained crew members and worked on the big robotic arm for a while. Um, but then I, I thought, well, I should go work in engineering. And I thought, well, what's gonna be the most fun thing to do over in engineering? Cause I, I thought I would really train astronauts. I thought that would be my job. Um, but I thought, okay, well, spacesuits kind of fun, right? Dad, Dad's always done this stuff. So let's go see what spacesuits are about. And then I got to meet Joe and he let me play in this lab and I got to touch my hardware and I got to get in my hardware. <laughs> and um, I just really started to get very interested in the open-ended kind of questions we were trying to solve uh, and the application we were trying to solve them for. And so um, I, I got very lucky and got in it that way. Um, I've had people come to it from a variety of um, directions. Uh, most of our civil servants have been a Pathways intern. And so that's the way they got to me because um, they tried it out and they thought it was cool and they stuck because um, it's not it's not for everybody I mean you, you know it, not everybody thinks that way or wants to interact with the human that much you know you know and most engineers are um, called considered an extrovert if they look at your shoes while they're talking to you instead of their shoes when they're talking to you so uh, <laughs> it's a little bit of a different, different kind of a thing <clears throat> um, but you know I also have team members now that um, come from our support contractors and of course now there are some companies that do spacesuit work so there are more opportunities to get involved with um, spacesuit design now and of course NASA hires more than just engineers um, I've got uh, an artist that I work with I've got photographers that I work with I've got nurses that I work with you know I've got um, accountants that I work with <laughs> you know, I've got a variety of people that work at NASA and just work on different aspects of the human spaceflight program Kasha, oh, that's so cool. Um, when you are testing the spacesuits and, and getting your human subjects to give you feedback, what are some of the metrics and, and ratings that you are using to get that feedback and to understand how it's performing? Yeah, of course, now my brain's not going to work. Um, the <laughs> Cooper Harper scale is one of them. Um, so it's a modified Cooper Harper scale. So you basically just ask a series of questions and the yes, no's lead you down to a numerical rating, right? And that can be a, a, a simplified one where it's just like five, five is um, usually very good. And then one is like, it, it sucks and I can't use it at all to get my job done. Uh, or one to 10, right? So 10 is great. And then one again sucks and I can't use it at all to get my job done. Um, throw it in the trash and start over kind of a rating. Right? 10 is I'll go fly it today if you need me to kind of a, a rating. Um, there's also uh, comfort ratings that we use. So we use a, a body model split into sections so they can point to where that um, like discomfort was and and then they can give us a severity. Again, that's uh, usually a one to five or one to seven scale. Um, the Portlet Bishop ratings too. Um, again, that's usually like a one to five, one to seven kind of a deal. <clears throat> and um, that just tells you how acceptable it was. Um, again, same basic purpose as the modified Cooper Harper. Um, and a lot of times we use those ratings more for management and um, requirement verification than we do to get the feedback. The feedback isn't the rating. The rating's nice and all, but what, why the crew member or subject gave that rating was the actual information that we use then to affect design, right? Um, so while 
my engineering managers want to see a graph with numbers on it. Um, and that makes them feel very happy and like they feel like they understood what happened. Um, that's only marginally useful for me. Okay. Uh, and, and the pages of comments that came with those ratings, that's what's the data for me. So how do you, this is a question I know I, I, have to field in my job a lot. How do you balance? Did you talk to 100 people <laughs> with like statistical relevance of these numbers with? I have qualitative data to back them up. I don't need to talk to 100 people. H how do you balance that? It is a constant battle. <laughs> <laughs> Remember those physiologists and people that I was talking about? Okay, they're more science types. Um, and science types love statistics, love, 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 love statistics. So anytime they want to do a test, they want to use no less than 20 more like your 100 number of people, right? Right. Um, I'm looking at the fact that I've got one prototype suit and a lot of different stuff to get done and only so many people and so many hours to do it in. So I normally get my answer in three to five subjects, <laughs> sometimes one or two and move on, right? Yeah. Um, so it depends at the level that we're working, how many people we have to involve in, how you know much um, support there is to spend that kind of time and money to get the 10 person answer versus the two person answer. Um, so that's kind of how that gets bracketed down for me. Um, when I have to verify a requirement or I have to get a community bought into my answer, that tends to justify greater time and effort spent. Um, but I will tell you, there have been very few tests in my career in which I've had more than 10 subjects involved. Um, more, most of the time you have like five subjects and three different test cases, right? So it's 15 tests, but still only five subjects. Okay, and, and that tends to give you better information than doing, you know, 20 subjects and just, you know, not getting the number of scenarios covered. Gotcha, yeah. yeah. Um, what in your experience has been the most challenging thing to design for, test for? Oh, well, let me go back on that last um, question okay. real quick. Uh, one of the benefits that I have in my job is that my customer is very authoritative in that <laughs> when they, they say they do like it or they don't like it, that's kind of the answer, right? <laughs> um, so I, I do have that tool called the crew memo where they have to have those you know, usually five, six, crew members participate in a test, and then they have to sit down together and come out with what their position is, okay? And if their position is, you passed, then you're kind of done, and people don't get to bother you about it much anymore, okay? If you didn't pass, then obviously you've got a problem because your user isn't accepting your hardware, and so you got to go fix it, done, right? You, you know what you're doing. Um, but that, I don't have to face that big, fuzzy, ambivalent, I got to sell this to the world kind of problem. I've got 40 folks that have to use this thing and, and five of them speak for that 40 and then I'm done, <laughs> which is a beautiful thing. Okay, as far as um, kind of the more challenging thing to design for, um, well, so one that we're working on right now is our requirement that is wanting us to go into a permanently shadowed region. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you know what these are, but basically it is craters on the south pole of the moon that never get sun all the way in them all the time. So oh, wow. there are some very unique gases and ices trapped in these things that people want to go get samples of to help them do the science about where the moon came from and also understand what kind of um, resources are on the moon. Um, but because they are permanently shadowed, <laughs> We already talk about, you know, going around the Earth and, and on the space station. Um, the temperatures are more like liquid helium temperatures. Oh, okay. Wow. So we're talking minus 400 kind of temperatures. Cold. Um, not many things are designed to operate in those temperatures, especially not sneakers. <laughs> hiking boots. And so we are trying to design hiking boots to go into permanently shattered regions. And uh, it's, it's not an easy problem to solve uh, and make those things um, flexible or usable at all. And maybe they won't be flexible or usable. Um, maybe we have these big clunky over boots that you put on and you stomp around like, um, you know, the big, you know, Jack's giant 
and you just you just feel clocky because you have to protect your feet so much from the cold temperature you're encountering in that area. Um, so you know I'm going to try to build this beautiful mobile walking planetary spacesuit, and uh, <laughs> then I'm going to clobber the boots with this giant overboot to maintain <laughs> thermal integrity. <laughs> it's it's a it's an ugly problem. I'd rather not go into a PSR. That's what robots are for, but um, right. that's my requirement right now. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, let's see. So um, a, another question is, how do you handle differences in opinions when it comes to making decisions? So I'm not sure if this is um, towards your larger <laughs> engineering team or your stakeholders or who, but how do you handle that? <laughs> yeah, so for my team, um, I'm the boss. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy answer. <laughs> so uh, I say that. I don't usually use that um, hammer very often. <laughs> um, yeah. But sometimes a decision does have to get made, right? For reals. And sometimes you, you're just the, that's the bad part of being the boss, uh, actually, right? You have to make those hard decisions and then, um, you know, space the consequences of them. And so, you know, that's, that's the not big bucks that I get paid to do that. <laughs> and, um, and so, I do want to hear everybody's information, right? And, and you know, most opinions come with some level of information behind them. And so mm -hmm. I, I want to hear those because I've got smart people on my team, right? I've got people that I respect. I've got people that are saying this for a reason. And I want to hear that um, because they're, they've probably been working their specific problem deeper than I have. And so they are more educated and more informed about that. Uh, and, and that can be from a couple, three different people, you know, coming at me with that same level of, of um, knowledge. So, you know, sometimes if it's a, a risk I'm accepting, um, I, I take that up. I, I can take that to my, my project manager because uh, she's the one who owns the risks for the project. And so if I'm trying to make a decision and that's going to affect what risk she's carrying, then we take that to her. Um, if it's just within the team and I'm needing to manage a, a disagreement between you know, individuals on my team that I can manage and that is mine to, to accept, um, then what I, 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 I use my experience a lot, my background, what, what I've seen with spacesuits. Um, and I, because I've been around a while, I can help weigh those um, different implications better so I, I can know which one has the less ugly behind it <laughs> coming at me? Because you know, probably either decision has some ugly behind it. Otherwise, they would be in agreement, right? Um, so they just think it's yeah, this is the good one. <laughs> but each one has some ugly, and so which ugly is is the better one to deal with, right? From a technical and programmatic viewpoint, um, yeah. a lot of times we do have disagreements between different um, divisions within NASA, like the you know, the, the physiologist doctor types over there might disagree with what we're doing over here. And so, um, again, our job a lot of times is just to communicate. It's just to put that, that information on the table that says, this is why we're saying this, and this is why this is our position. Um, and, and these are the risks or implications of, of making a different decision, right? And then they do the same thing. And then usually somebody above my boss's boss um, has to kind of settle that too, because it's it's you know some higher level of risk that, that we're <laughs> discussing at the time, right? Exactly. And, and so there's a, a chain of command, and there's a hierarchy uh, where these different decisions get made, and you know that that person at that point just has to you know suck it up and accept what you know what they're accepting. Yeah, and, and along those lines, has there been something that you were designing for working for that just are utterly failed, just didn't. <laughs> Out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, most of my career has been spent doing research and development. And so the whole point of research and development is that you're breaking stuff and failing, right? So if, yeah. if you did it right the first time, it wasn't that hard of a problem to solve or somebody had already <laughs> solved it and you didn't really need to do what you were doing. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, we tried a shoulder design one time and the shoulder design and concept uh, really wasn't that bad, but how it was implemented was terrible. It did not move the way we needed it to move, and so um, it helped us understand the, the the nuances of that design, and that helped us appreciate the complexities of of, of 
addressing the nuances of that design. And so we threw it to the side and we didn't go there anymore. <laughs> Bad shoulder. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. And uh, the last question for the evening is, um, space is very much an international endeavor, right? Um, what kind of collaboration do you have with other countries and their space suit designers and, and engineers? I'm hoping to see more. Um, I've reached out a few years ago and tried to find even the points of contact on spacesuit work in ESA, um, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. Um, yeah. And then, and of course, there are some colleagues over in Russia that I know that work on, on suits, but I don't get to work with them very often. Um, yeah. So to date, there hasn't been a lot of um, collaboration for a number of reasons. Uh, one, in general, I've worked on research and development, and uh, there's just usually not a big budget there, and there's not a lot of um, real motivation to send me to Russia or Japan or <laughs> Germany yeah. or somewhere. Uh, to go do spacesuit work because you know my budget is is not that big, um, so no, we're, no, you can't go. Um, and and just on that side, ESA and JAXA were in a similar situation. They just didn't have a lot of money at the time to be doing suit development. That's not what their charter was at the time. That's not where they were investing. Um, then sometimes people kind of hold that stuff close to their chest, and we consider this, um, you know, uh, what do I call it you know, critical information, um, yeah, what, I, ITAR, what's that stand for, that kind of um, information, along the same lines as, as missile designs and that kind of stuff, it's that kind protected. Like national secret, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so um, other countries also tend to treat it that way, so, you know, having those conversations is, is kind of tough. Now, the International Space Station has allowed there to be some channels to have some conversations, and so I did do some boot testing with some Russians. Um, they brought their boot design over. We put it in our suit. We tested them um, with, you know, our, our boot too. And they got the data and we got the data. And it was interesting. It was fun to work with people. You know, I don't usually get to talk with suit designers because <laughs> there aren't very many of us. And so it was really fun to do it. Um, I did talk to some of the Japanese folks uh, and, and saw what they were working on. Um, but I really just got a presentation from them. And um, I didn't get to follow up much on that. Um, ESA at the time didn't have much spacesuit work going on. I think they've been doing some work with the Russians, um, but I, I haven't been in that loop. Um, I, that's, and then of course we don't talk to the Chinese. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I would like to do more of that. I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, it, it's very interesting to see the different um, approaches and prioritizations of um, the design aspects, because we definitely have an American viewpoint, um, which is very different from the Russian viewpoint. Um, and, and so I'd like to hear more about how the, you know, the Japanese and the, and the Europeans are thinking about it as well. Um, but we do have a conference called the International Conference on Environmental Systems. And that's where I do get to talk to more people interested in space through design from different places. And so uh, we were supposed to go to Lisbon this year. Of course, we didn't do that. <laughs> it was in July, to be in July. And uh, we yeah, had to postpone yeah. it. So maybe next year in Lisbon, we'll get to go talk to some <laughs> folks about their spacesuit work too. <laughs> That's very cool. So do, do they then, um, does every space agency have a suit program or do they maybe borrow suits from somebody else if they don't have? Yeah, so um, if you will, if you know your spacesuit history, the Chinese suit looks an awful lot like the Russian suit. <laughs> So, you know, the relations between China and Russia have gone up and down, but, you know, at various points in time, they were able to get hardware and they, you know, the Chinese, you know, designed off of, off of what they had to use. Um, and, and that's that's space history per, per Amy, but <laughs> I don't think it's that different from what's in a lot of the space history books you'll find. Um, so, like, ESA has had, had programs off and on, but not necessarily a steady one. Ours, we've had somebody always work because, you know, for a while it was Joe and me, and then Joe retired, and it was uh, me and Lindsay. <laughs> so for a while it was, you know, a, a one person and then two person show, right? Um, and so we may have always had some, but it wasn't always a big sum, right? Right. Um, I don't know if the Japanese have continued their effort or not. Uh, I think they they closed their neutral buoyancy tank, and so if you don't have a neutral buoyancy tank, you kind of don't need a suit program. 
So I don't know that they're still working on that, but um, that's just the, the best of my knowledge. And I don't know that for sure right now. Yeah, yeah. and the Chinese have a program. Exactly. Well, Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. I have read nothing but wonderful comments in the chat the whole night. They, everybody loved the presentation. They really got a lot out of it. I know I have. I, I always well, I appreciate it. the questions because that's what makes this, guys. I mean, I can do my spiel, but that's not nearly as much fun as when we interact. So thank you for the questions. Exactly. Uh -oh. Well, and thank you so much for joining us. I hope your dogs uh, treat you well tonight. We've got to go take them for a walk, I know. Yep. <laughs> it's so be safe. Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining us as well. We'll be putting the video up on YouTube uh, as soon as I can get it to do its thing and letting everybody know about it. So thanks again. Everybody have a good night, good day, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank <laughs> you for coming, everybody. Bye.